Thank you. Um, I've been told I have to stay very close to this microphone. Um, thank you, Your Royal Highness, uh, for these um, remarks and this wonderful introduction to set the tone uh, for this panel. Boosting green skills to accelerate uh, the climate uh, transition. Um, this COP um, is all about the transformation of the future, the economy of 2030, the economy of 2040. And it, need, it will need to be radically different. going to help us uh, achieve this transformed economy. We need to invest in green skills and in people. I uh, was quite surprised, I have to say, when I saw the CEO letter coming out in advance of COP28. Um, I think the WEF organized it. I don't know whether anybody on this panel actually signed it. There were many CEOs who signed it. The letter called for um, governments to take action to reach the net zero target in four very important areas. One, regulation. Two, infrastructure. Three, technology. Four, reporting standards. What was missing? <laughs> <laughs> what was missing is what we are talking about today. <laughs> and so we need to get much more serious about skilling in this climate transition. 40%, less than 40% of the NDCs have, trans have actually skills plans in them. So the planning that is going on in countries around the transition is missing this critical um, element. And we need skills in many areas, and we will talk about this um, on this panel. At EDC, we have been working on identifying the gaps that we need to uh, overcome to solve the skills crisis. Um, because today, um, less than 40% of young people have even basic secondary level skills. That's more than 800 million young people who are not even having basic secondary skills in literacy and numeracy. We're not talking about more advanced skills that we need for the future economy. And we need to fill a number of gaps to overcome this. The first, of course, is uh, creating the, the systems that can train and skill people. Secondly is data um, around the labor market, what the opportunities are out there. Third is um, finance, not only um, to finance education systems, but also to help uh, these young people start businesses. We need better coordination between climate um, communities and other communities, such as the education community, and we need social inclusion. Those are the topics that I hope we can discuss today uh, with this esteemed panel. And I will turn now to my first um, wonderful panelist here on my side, um, Alan Blue, co-founder of LinkedIn. Um, we love your platform. I hope you're all on it. Um, I will connect with you um, at the end of this panel. Is that me? Or me? <laughs> um, so, Alan, um, you have been a real advocate for skills, um, and uh, we are taking stock at COP28 um, on the progress towards the climate goals mm -hmm. and the global stock take. Let's take stock of the global climate talent. Um, what's your perception? Where are the gaps? What needs to happen? Mm. <coughs> um, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, and uh, uh, I would like to just say a little bit about LinkedIn. Basically, I know you're all familiar with the platform, um, but it is the source of data that we rely on to be able to provide. Um, <laughs> to provide the kinds of insights that basically uh, I'm gonna talk about today and also the ones we share here at COP with governments through the World Economic Forum and through many other venues. 
basically, you all know how LinkedIn works. You come to LinkedIn, you fill out a profile, people post jobs on LinkedIn. Those are data points generated from a, a billion human beings, a billion users, um, which basically give us really deep knowledge about skills, what skills are present in the workforce, which ones are demanded, and basically what we're seeing in the world of green skills and green jobs is that in the past few years, the hiring in the world of green, uh, green skills and green jobs has been fully 25% above hiring across all other industries on average. And that's even in a time, basically, when there's been a substantial downturn in, in hiring around the world uh, to do with the pandemic. Um, that is a tremendously good piece of news because it means that a lot of the projects that we all are talking about here and the people who've been contributing to uh, working on climate change forever, those things are coming true. Those things are actually being implemented in the real world. But the problem is that even though the number of green jobs is going up and the demand for green skills is going up, the actual number of human beings who have the skills necessary to take those jobs is only growing linearly, only 9% over the same period of time. Um, so basically, we're about to hit a point where the requirements to hire people are going to outstrip the actual number of people who have those skills. And that is something which has, uh, as uh, Bear said at the beginning, has the possibility of bottlenecking many of the projects that we're talking about making real here. So at LinkedIn, we have data which is based, uh, which is worldwide. And there are lots of variations between places. And I'm happy to talk later on if there are specific areas, if I can bring them all to mind. Um, but we do have specific things we ask um, three main stakeholders to do. So the first stakeholder is companies. In the end, companies are going to be doing all the hiring, well, most of the hiring anyway, to be able to make this transition happen. And companies have to take some responsibility to make sure they hire based on these skills and that they're willing to train employees, not just to reskill, but also new employees to take on the skills that they need. Secondly, we call on investors. So, as you said, there's been a huge amount of conversation around finance. Um, fin uh, people who are investing look at their investments here uh, in terms of risk. One of the risks they need to be considering is, is there a workforce who can actually execute the project that I wish to invest in? So as part of that de-risking process, we have a real possibility for investors to drive the growth of green skills and green workforce all around the world. And finally, of course, there's government. Government, whether it be through regulation or other mechanisms, has the ability to spur investment in the development of green skills. And uh, we hope in the next years that, uh, to your point about whether this has actually risen to the top of the list or not, we hope to see well more than 40% of the commitments that people are making, including the reskilling needs. And we will do everything we can to make sure that happens. Thank you so much. And thank you for making the point about the, the supply and demand um, kind of outstripping. Uh, as an economist myself, I, I, I'm waiting for someone to actually put a number to that, the cost, the extra cost to the climate community of not having the labor available and the sort of premiums that are likely doing to going to come on to um, labor as a result of that. I am going to turn to Somachi um, Asukola from uh, CEO of the Tony Elamalu Foundation. Um, Somachi, you uh, lead a wonderful uh, foundation that is doing tremendous work on skilling and entrepreneurship. Um, could you comment a little bit on the issues that you see with education and training systems in countries to get the essential skills that go beyond uh, perhaps the basic literacy and numeracy, we need to go into entrepreneurship skills, obviously green skills. How can we build that and what is missing at the moment uh, where you are operating and what solutions are you working on? No, thank you so much, Lisbeth. It's, it's a wonderful pleasure to be here. I think first, we know that Africa is the youngest continent by far. 
Um, the median age across many countries in Africa is 17. That means we have more people under 17 than we have over 17. And in 2010, when the Tony L. Melu Foundation was founded, we did so with the realization that to transform the African narrative and to create the jobs and to eradicate poverty and to ensure inclusive economic empowerment, we could no longer rely on our government, we couldn't look abroad for support, but we needed to empower a new generation of private sector players because we deeply believe that it's the private sector that transforms economies and you know, change the trajectory of any one economy. And so at the Tony L. Melu Foundation, we realized again that when we discuss private sector, we shouldn't restrict it to corporates. We should really look at SMEs, so those micro and small businesses that need that extra financing, that extra training, that extra access to physical and digital markets. And so that's why we started the Tony L. Melu Foundation Entrepreneurship Program in 2015. Now, the great news is that we've trained over 1.5 million young people in how to start a business, how to scale a business, and how to sustain that business success. And um, we've gone ahead to fund 18,000 of them across all 54 African countries. Um, but very quickly, we also realized that we shouldn't just be starting businesses as usual on the continent, but we should be training business owners on how to think around sustainability. Because Africa contributes the least to the climate crisis, but we will bear the majority of the negative consequences of climate change. Many parts of our continent are already in great threat. We see the Sahel region where over 70% of jobs no longer exist. So we should be equipping our young people, not just to start new businesses, but to think around how they can drive and lead climate action on the continent. In fact, yesterday, um, the Tony L. Mello Foundation hosted a round table in the Blue Zone, um, and we had one of our alumni from uh, Madagascar coming, um, Christabel, and she's talking about Madagascar and the fact that Madagascar is the third most vulnerable nation to climate change in the world, um, how three in 10 Madagascar um, families are threats, their livelihoods are threats because of climate change. And the business that we've supported at the start um, is around taking cooking oil waste and creating bar soaps out of it, edible bar soaps that communities and families use without needing water. So eight in 10 families in Madagascar have no access to running stable um, water. So with this soap that she's creating, she's helping to eliminate cooking waste, she's helping to sanitize um, water sources in Madagascar, she's helping to create economic opportunity for the over 50 people she's employing, and most importantly, she's helping to sanitize and keep families safe. This is how we're now training entrepreneurs to think around not just starting a business, but your business has to directly contribute to fighting climate change and creating climate resiliency in Africa. Mm -hmm. Because we realize that if we create business as usual, then we're just gonna be even in more danger. And so we need to begin to educate entrepreneurs, give them the training. We're working with IKEA Foundation now to develop green curricula around waste management, around mm -hmm. circular economies, around the blue economy, so that entrepreneurs are learning and you know, being inspired around how to contribute directly and take the charge. Last word is that because we realize our governments would not do that, um, we're not gonna help get help all the help we need from abroad, so we need to begin to take charge and fight climate change and build resiliency on the continent driven by our young people. Thank you, thank you very much. It's a big challenge. I wouldn't give up on the governments though, um, and I'm going to turn to Peter. Um, I don't know whether Peter Backer will be able to tell me a lot about governments, but I would like to push you on this a little bit. Um, you lead um, a, an incredible organization, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, that brings businesses together to act um, around <laughs> sustainability. And I would love to ask you um, about what the business community is doing itself to address this issue. But also if you could comment a little bit on why are businesses not on the street um, essentially calling on governments to act. Um, we have not seen the same pressure from businesses that sometimes happen in other areas. As I was saying earlier, a letter to world leaders to act on these four areas. 
why are we not asking governments to act on investing in education and skills? Well, thank Go you. Hey, thanks so much. Yeah, normally, you invite people on panels because they have all the answers. And <laughs> um, I on, actually, on neither of the questions, there are good answers. Mm -hmm. But I'll try anyway. The, the problem with the climate transition and what it will do for jobs and the skills that people need at the moment has these broad answers. You know, by 2050, we'll create 200 million new jobs. We'll lose 185 million jobs, and so net-net it will all be okay. And we know that's wrong, mm -hmm. because the jobs that get lost are very different skills than the job that gets created, and how are we going to treat the people who lose their jobs? And we've seen great examples, hard hats emerging six months after the Paris Agreement by one of the political candidates saying we're bringing coal back to Ohio. That was the mistake we all made in Paris. And we're now, whatever we are, eight years later, and I don't think we have much better answers. Mm -hmm. So we have run in, in the World Business Council the Business Commission to Tackle Inequality. 40 CEOs, 25 experts working together for two years on what is inequality, how can business uh, understand those topics, and what are the actions we need to consider. And reskilling education is one of the core action areas that we need to deploy. Mm. But having those conversations, and that might actually be the reason why in the CEO letter that disappointed you, education isn't in, inequality, social impact, is still a pretty uncomfortable bedfellow for most business leaders. So that's one topic, and there we need to push hard. The second topic I want to raise is we are all screaming at business leaders, you need to provide the solutions, you need to lead the transformation, financial market and philanthropy are here to help. But if you think through that, how many, not CEOs or CSOs, they get it, but chief procurement officers, you know, chief engineers, whatever technical functionalities in companies actually have the skills to think through what does it mean, this transformation. So we need short-term, massive education tools into business to make the people who are making the decisions today aware of what that transformation is. That's my second point. I think the, the third point is this week is an exciting week because we'll see big announcements, tripling renewable energy, doubling green hydrogen, the Industrial Transition Alliance is being announced this afternoon, real attempts to get large-scale business and government working together on how do we really get this transformation done. No more roadmaps, commitments and targets, actual investable projects on the ground. But the point I would make, and, and we'll try to do our best to bring it in, none of those pathways or plans today have a skills map at the end of it. And then the, my last point, and and then I'll, I, I, I think I've depressed the room enough. <laughs> I'll give you the example of the car industry. There's probably no other industry which is transforming as fast as the car industry. Combustion engines are dead or as good as that. Electric vehicles are the answer. We need to move fast. And they're all moving bloody fast. But if you look in a, a car company and the assembly line impact of moving from combustion to electric vehicles, you'll lose thousands of jobs per company, but almost none of those jobs are in the company because they're in the supply chain, in, in suppliers who make gearboxes and catalyzers and whatever else goes in the car. And so the company has only the responsibility to make sure that people who screw cars together in an assembly line know it's no longer a combustion but an electric vehicle that goes in but the job losses are somewhere completely different and therefore not the responsibility of the individual CEO who makes the choice. And that calls for, we need collaboration across value chains, we need collaboration across sectors, and on the social agenda that has not been invented yet. And so that brings me to this forum. That's where I think business, public, and philanthropy can do a massive job to much better map what are the social implications of what we're going to do. And then the outcome, and then I'll end on a positive note, Lisbeth, 
In WBCSD, we have five priorities, climate, nature, equity, uh, redefining value, the whole capitalism that needs to be toppled. And the fifth one is education. And of all the sectors, of all the five pillars where we work, education blows out the growth by far. So there is hope. Brilliant. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, that is, uh, thank you for the hopeful message. We will come back later and ask all of you to give us a hopeful message. Um, I would like to turn to um, ba ba Bakri. Um, Bakri and Brothers ne doesn't need an introduction, at least for me, because I spent five years living in Indonesia. Um, wonderful country. Thank you very much. I even have my husband here sitting in the front row who was <laughs> also there. Um, and we uh, have very good memories. The Bakri Group is a um, very large uh, company, deals in many, many businesses. Um, I'd like to ask you, how are you tackling the issue of skills? Is it a problem for you? And how are you addressing it within your own company, within your supply chains? Thank you uh, for the question and, of course, <coughs> the opportunity to present. But let me give a little context of uh, Indonesia to uh, the esteemed um, audience here. One, it is a country of 285 million people. Uh, in Southeast Asia, um, 17,500 islands. So vulnerability is there when it comes to you know, climate change, right? Um, high temperature, high humidity, uh, rising sea level is uh, just uh, to name the few. If you remember, in the year of 2000, there was a big Aceh tsunami, mm -hmm. right? That's just one. We don't expect and we don't want uh, something like that. But you know, it is always in the mind of the people. This is just 20 years ago or so, right? The second thing also, these 285 million people, um, two thirds of them uh, are still below 40 years old, mm -hmm. right? It is not as uh, extreme as the 17 year old, <laughs> but 40 years, uh, 285 million people, they need jobs, they need security. So whatever we talk about, about boosting green skills, we need to make sure that the, the youth, uh, as uh, Her uh, Excellency mentioned, uh, is uh, in the picture. Right? Now, when we look at Indonesia, where can we help to decarbonize or modernize uh, the world, right? At least there are three things we can think of. The first one is by uh, preserving and also valuing our biodiversity. This is the plants and the animal that we have plenty. So we have the third largest uh, forest, people know about this, but uh, we actually have a lot of mangroves uh, and peatlands that actually absorb more CO2 uh, than the forest itself. Uh, let alone we have also coral reef uh, and the uh, seagrass. Uh, Mr. Ray Dalio mentioned about the Ocean X, uh, that's one of the uh, uh, projects that we really appreciate. Right? So the second thing is of course um, electrifying uh, combustion. In a combustion engine uh, is, is because we have this uh, critical minerals uh, under the ground uh, mm -hmm. that we can you know, process, whether that's nickel, uh, copper, tin, zinc, and we hope to process it using, of course, renewable energy, and that's the third thing that we can um, you know, contribute. To. But all of these uh, are, are nice, but we need capital, technology, and policy, mm -hmm. right? So when we talk about uh, skill sets that we need, the green uh, skills. One, I would say we need green diplomats, right? Mm. Because we have to think how we can value biodiversity is easier said than done, and how do we agree with it? Imagine uh, the amount of uh, CO2 capture that we can do can be turned into you know, capital. I was doing some real math, right? It is as much as a trillion US dollars, which is as much as the Inflation Reduction Act money, right? So if we can do that, that's, that's, that's kind of big uh, for a country like Indonesia. The second thing that's also uh, interesting, I think, is uh, you know, green uh, technical skills. Yeah. Whether that's you know, how, it, it's so much different to uh, process uh, internal combustion engine and EV. It's so much different between making steam engine, uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, power plant, and also you know, solar panel, geothermal, and so on. So those skills are very much needed. And also, I think green finance skills, right? Because we living in the global south, uh, 
we always uh, you know look uh, into the big program like JetP and all that to be able to support us right mm -hmm. we are a big economy you know, 15 largest in the world we were the president of G20 last year but at the same time you know average uh, uh, GDP per capita is still you know four thousand five hundred dollars you know if you want to be the level we want to be in 20 years we should be at thirty thousand which is you know uh, many times over right uh, so the ability to think about, and that's why this uh, forum is, is uh, very uh, correct, you know, to try to combine between business and philanthropy because we cannot necessarily uh, pay the commercial rate uh, to be able to deploy uh, those uh, low carbon development. Mm. And lastly, I want to mention that we know uh, that the group or Indonesia don't have all the uh, skill sets uh, mm. and, and the knowledge in the world. So what we did uh, three weeks ago uh, we had this cooperation with uh, Stanford Sustainability School uh, in San Francisco during APEC. The president went there, gave a beautiful speech and all that. But the thing is, uh, one thing that's interesting about this, I think this is one of the schools, uh, I may be biased, but uh, that uh, tried to solve the 21st century uh, you know, problem, right, which is climate change, right? And, and, and uh, the uh, interwoven between departments uh, is what we need, you know, whether that's social science, that's engineering, uh, political science, it's all uh, connected. So I think when Ellen mentioned about LinkedIn, uh, you know, trying uh, to solve this thing, I think we need quite a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think I'm going to stop there. And, and again, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. I will talk, uh, turn to you, Claudia uh, Azevedo, CEO of Sonai. Um, you also lead an amazing company working on retail, t telecom, cybersecurity, working across 90 countries. And you also recently formulated a new vision for your organization around purpose. Um, and we talked a little bit about how are you engaging with the business community and the larger community to create um, a movement because we um, doing work in each of our own companies or our own businesses is not enough and our own projects is not enough. We need to build a movement that brings stakeholders together, as Peter was saying also, collaboration across um, value chains. I'd love to hear about your experience in your own company, but also how you've been working on doing exactly that in the European Union. Okay, sure. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, in in the European Roundtable, it's a group of uh, fifty something European CEOs, and uh, you know, talking a lot about the the dual transition, the digital transition, and the green transition, and you know, a lot of numbers, very big numbers, sort of start uh, coming up of how many people are going to lose their job, how many people, and so we had uh, we could start screaming at governments, but uh, we reserved that for other matters like a bureaucracy. <laughs> Um, so we, we took this in our own hands and we said, look, uh, at the moment, reskilling, independently if it's for the green uh, industry or other industries, reskilling is a vicious circle. So, you know, governments look at it uh, with their, their, their departments for training. They, they train people on a skill. It, they don't look if that, if that is an employable or not. It's sort of, I'm going to give you 30 hours of, of this training and you're going to be trained. Training partners, the ones that produce the content, are also sort of, I produce 20 hours of content, I produce 30 hours of content. It does, there's no employability uh, to it. And companies uh, like, like myself are very skeptical uh, of hiring people that have been reskilled because, so what's your previous experience? Your previous experience is something, <laughs> is something totally different because you've been reskilled, right? So you don't have a previous uh, experience uh, and uh, you don't have a diploma of a university. So companies are sort of frown upon what is this... Uh, uh, and, and fourthly, the actual people that need reskilling um, have to think very hard. Um, am I going to invest my money and my time uh, if this doesn't work, right? And so we looked at this visual ecosystem and said, look, we have to, we have to look at it end to end. And the, the indicator has to be employ employability, right? So uh, as companies, we don't, we don't want to operate the system, but I think we are the orchestrators. Our responsibility is to orchestrate that it all works. And so we started a pilot in three countries, Portugal, Spain, and Sweden. Um, so in our Portuguese pilot, we were also responsible for that, for that pilot and uh, with, with the help of, of McKinsey also in the European Roundtable. And what we did, we got also the 40 largest Portuguese companies and put them in the system and uh, to, to sort of, from end to end, sort of say, okay, training, 
let's change the training. Let's the companies tell us what you need. And sort of seven labs that we came up, one of them a green lab, of course, sort of what do you need? Uh, and got the government to change the, the, the curriculum uh, for it to be more employable. So we got also the, the people that do the training. Uh, you could. Uh, it's going to be faster. We're also introducing some online, because the number of people that we have to reskill, you know, 5 mm. million in 2030 in Europe, it, it's amazing. So we need to, to really scale this up. But um, it's, it's working, and that's good. And everybody is very focused. Everybody understands that uh, from now, from, as, as you said, from A to B, uh, we're going to lose a lot of jobs, and we're going to create a lot of jobs. H how it's done is, is very, very tough, right? Uh, and so this... I think this public-private partnership is working so far, but it, it's a lot of hard work. Mm. Yeah, a lot of very good lessons to be <laughs> learned. Um, at the um, Africa Climate Summit um, earlier this year in September, um, there was a high-level panel um, as well calling for a global action plan on this issue. Um, the First Lady of Kenya, who um, as, uh, unfortunately couldn't join us here today, um, uh, with other first ladies uh, called on the world and on leaders to come up with an action plan and actually called for a coalition that is a little bit akin to what you are describing, Claudia. And so one of the things that uh, at my organization, EDC, and also with other partners we have been thinking about is what can we do? What is the action plan that we can put forward so at the next COP and the next COP and for the rest of time, this issue becomes at the center of the debate and the action. So um, I'd like to um, put forward this idea of what is this collaborative that we could create together um, in terms of uh, taking action, uh, moving forward. It needs to be concrete, it needs to engage public-private sector, it needs to engage countries that um, have the ambition uh, to move forward, it needs to have a political movement behind it, a youth movement, there are lots of components to it. And, and Claudia, you, you, we could learn a lot from what you've been trying to do. In Europe, we need to put this on steroids because the real problem, as we were hearing earlier from Samachi, is actually in Africa where um, at the moment, I was mentioning 40% earlier of, of young people who have basic secondary skills. In sub-Saharan Africa, that is 10%. And the largest population labor force will be in Africa um, over time. So how are we going to solve the problem there? So I want to turn back to my panelists in quick succession and ask them each, what is the, the hope, going back to Peter, what's the hopeful action that we can take, you yourself or you propose we instigate um, here and now to uh, start making a difference. Um, Alan, I'll turn to you. What's the hopeful action? So, um, so Claudia, I entirely, I entirely agree the connection between employability mm -hmm. and training is absolutely essential uh, to be able to make this thing work. However, it also needs to work differently from place to place. Mm -hmm. Every community, every mm -hmm. culture has a different way of doing workforce mm -hmm. preparedness. Um, so we work with, a, at LinkedIn, we work with a, a, a group called, uh, called Year Up. And it's not climate related specifically, but basically it's a very, it's a high level of investment per uh, young person. Mm -hmm. They come in. Uh, basically with very few skills, being prepared, but being prepared to be IT professionals. And after the year, in year up, they have actually been well prepared, and they've been prepared by the companies that will eventually hire them. That is one example among many of great mm -hmm. partnerships, in this case between philanthropy mm -hmm. and business, mm -hmm. which tie the output of the system to exactly what the company needs. And the great thing about it is that it's actually, it, it is not scalable in the sense that they could run that same program everywhere, but it is scalable in that the model works. 
and could be replicated in the variations it requires in every location around the world. But there are others as well. I mean, the one you're sure. talking about is exactly the same. So if investors are thinking about it and companies are thinking about it and we're setting aside the ability to spend on these things, then we have many, many models we can reach out to for success. No, I, I, I totally agree, Alan. I think even in Europe, each country has its different model and yes. sort of wants its especially sort of flavor. In <laughs> especially in Europe, like we're European because of that. Each one wants their flavor. Um, I think uh, the, um, if, you, if you have three categories of, you have the, the people that are, are unemployed and uh, um, the government has some sort of training program or some, s so some sort of security. Then you have the employed and the companies there can sort of reskill and, and are, are obviously uh, have that responsibility. And then um, we have this sort of untapped potential and, uh, and, and linking this with the youth that you were talking about and women, right? We have a lot of women, a lot of youth that are in low paid jobs, services, uh, commerce, basic agriculture. And I think that this, uh, this reskilling, these digital tools that we have can take those people and to, to better jobs. Um, and so that's my wish, that um, this huge community of women and, and youth um, can have better jobs. Yeah, no, I think that I am a firm believer in partnerships and um, we advocate that we don't try to recreate the same wheel. I think that we all have competitive um, expertise in different parts of the same um, chain. And instead of trying to do what another actor is doing and succeeding in doing, um, we collaborate so that we can leverage the different skills and expertise and tools and the resources and capital ETC. Um, that way, uh, we scale much quicker. Um, we achieve far-reaching, um, wider impact. Um, and that way, we continue to build on that expertise. Um, and that's why at the foundation, our partners include development agencies around the world, um, private sector companies around the world, um, as well as governments, especially in Europe. Um, in fact, our, business, our biggest partnership is the European Commission. Um, we signed a $25 million or 20 million euro partnership in um, 2021, and we're doubling that this year um, because the European Commission realizes that in order to reach the women and young people, um, they need to partner with people on ground. And the foundation um, empowers young people across all 54 African countries. And so instead of recreating and duplicating that wheel, it says, you know, come to the table. Let's, let's see how we can join forces um, to scale the impact you've achieved on your own. And that's why we're launching what we're now calling a coalition for African entrepreneurs because we don't want to do this on our own anymore. We want to reach out to other like-minded partners who are, you know, who, who are seeing and who are concerned um, about all the change that is needed. I think that we all know that status quo cannot continue as is. Um, there's so much threat to stability, to livelihoods, to income, especially to our young people and our women. They form the majority of the most vulnerable communities across the continent. And so instead of doing this on our own, like we've been doing since 2010, um, we're really scaling and opening up um, this coalition for African entrepreneurs. We'll be focusing on the green, focusing on digital, focusing on agriculture, creative industry, and technology. Um, because we think these are very key sectors that have you know, more potential than other sectors to employ more young people, create more jobs, and ensure more inclusive economic opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I'm very happy to continue the discussion with anyone in the room, um, because we need to scale, unite, and work very quickly together. Mm -hmm. I think from my side, um, two things at least. Uh, one, how do we involve uh, the youth uh, better in this forum? I think we have done uh, something, but one of the forum that we have seen before, they have these global shapers, uh, young global leader, whatnot. That's just one example. Um, and the second thing, how do we communicate uh, better with these young people? Uh, there is also a different way of saying. I think uh, Her Majesty mentioned a little bit uh, about it. Uh, because uh, we uh, have this uh, media company and we run a survey. You remember I mentioned that uh, Indonesia is $4,500 per capita, so that's about $400 uh, per month. So 
anybody below uh, 40 years old are willing to spend additional $60, which is about 15%, uh, on uh, climate uh, change initiatives, buying <laughs> services, products, and so on. So I guess what I'm saying is uh, if we focus on communicating in the right way, that's a whole new economy, and not just any economy, but uh, a sustainable economy. Thanks. So, uh, well, the hope is COP28, actually. I mean, look, look around us. You know, we're talking about the topic here. Just transition is big. Food and nature for the first time. So we begin to understand that we're talking about system transformation. And we begin to understand that that has to be people-centric. The second hope is you see now solutions are taking off at exponential pace. So the growth in the solutions is finally picking up. I am absolutely absolutely convinced the market will find the skills to drive the solutions. I'm deeply worried about those that are left behind who do not have the skills. Yes. And that's, that's, I guess, this conversation, because that will drive inequality, which will drive polarization, which will make success of COPs impossible. And therefore, this is the critical agenda to have. We have the Business Commission to tackle inequality, which we're building as a non-WBCSD branded collaborative platform where this will be the absolute priority. So any way we can collaborate, help bring people together, make people part of it, we'll drive the hope that way. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to this wonderful panel and to all of you for being here today, Your Royal Highness, for giving this wonderful introduction as well. We are very keen um, at EDC to work with all of you. Um, as I said earlier, I think we have some amazing energy going on. We have amazing ideas already out there. We need to collaborate even more ferociously and intensively <laughs> to make it add up uh, more than the sum of us. Um, hope that you will reach out to all to us or to uh, the panelists to join us. Um, uh, we called for a global action plan, a coalition, and we look forward to building that um, as we uh, move forward from here. Thank you very much, and uh, we see each other again. <laughs>